Good morning, church. My name is Cody Hill. I'm one of the pastors here, uh, and it is a privilege to be here uh, with you this morning. Um, some things have changed in my life since I've been up here last. Uh, my wife and I uh, have welcomed in our new son, Brooks, into the world, um, and it has been amazing, and we are adjusting to life of uh, two kids now, which has been a whirlwind and crazy. Um, but I get the privilege of mainly hanging out um, with these students here before you. Um, we have some awesome students in this church. Um, and that's usually who I'm with and, and who I uh, am spending time with and teaching to. But I'm so excited to be with you this morning. We're going to be in Luke chapter 19. And we're going to go through 28 uh, through 42. And in, in looking at what today is, right, Palm Sunday, this is kind of the thing that sets it all off, right? Jesus is making his entry back in, and this is going to be what sets pace to change the world forever, right? This is the hope, the start of the hope that we are clinging to as believers, right? Because it's gearing up to Easter, and ultimately, as we'll see Jesus um, taking the cross for every one of us, but this is the beginning of hope and resurrection of this week, right? And so as we dive in and as we look in this, starting in verse 28, said, when we, or when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples and said, go into the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a young donkey tied there on which no one has ever set. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent left and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the young donkey, its owners said to them, why are you untying the donkey? The Lord needs it, they said. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their clothes on the donkey, they helped Jesus get on it. As he was going along, they were spreading the clothes on the road. Now he came near the path down the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of the disciples began praising God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. And as he approached and saw the city, he wept for it, saying, if you knew this day, what would bring peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. We see that Jesus begins to make this final journey, right? His final voyage is to be the last trip that he ever takes. And in taking this 17-mile trip, Jesus has been healing people. He's just preached and he's just been teaching. Um, and so there's a lot of buzz going on around Jesus at this time. And then in 28, it says, as he's headed in Jerusalem, he approaches Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, and he sends two disciples and he said, go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a young donkey tied there on which no one has ever set. Untie it and bring it. Right, so Jesus is saying, hey, look, you're gonna go into this, you're gonna find this donkey. It's gonna be a young donkey, right? And this is just not like any regular donkey, but this is a donkey that nobody has ever ridden before. Right, see, this was a common practice for politicians or, or important people to go borrow an animal from somebody and ride in and everybody would make fanfare as they came in. But this isn't just not some donkey, right? This is a donkey that has been unridden, right? As if to say this is the purest of the pure, right? This is as pure as it gets, right? A pure and innocent donkey ushering in the spotless lamb as he starts his descent to what will be his end. And so Jesus goes and tells them, if anybody asks, tell them that the Lord needs it, that the Lord is in need. So those who were sent left and found it just as they had told him. And as they were untying the young donkey, its owner said to them, 
Why are you untying the donkey? And the disciples said, because the Lord needs it. Right, in obedience, they follow. Right, I can imagine they're to the point of everything that they've seen, right? Jesus says to go do something, and like, all right, we'll go do it. Right, even if somebody's like, hey, why are you taking my donkey from me? Right, all they had to say was that the Lord needed it. Right, and it was done. So then they bring it to Jesus, and they throw their clothes on the donkey, and they help Jesus get on it. And then they begin to throw their clothes on the ground, right? This is not something that, it, that is an uncommon thing for these people. Um, this is something that is reserved for people of importance or political leaders of importance, right? This is the same thing that we see in, excuse me, in 2 Kings, right? <clears throat> when Jehu is acclaimed king and they begin to bring him in and they begin to throw their garments down on the clothes and they're providing this clean way. They're providing this perfect path for him to walk, right? But not only that, we see that Jesus in this moment begins to fulfill this prophecy, right? We see in Zechariah 9.9, 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion, and shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, Right? These things don't just happen by accident. Everything that the Old Testament has proclaimed about Jesus has been fulfilled unto now, right? And so you have all of these people in Jerusalem who have grown up reading the Old Testament and they've grown up studying all of these things and knowing these prophecies, right? And the Messiah is being unveiled before them, right? This is taking place as they're seeing it happen before their eyes, And as they're spreading these clothes on the ground, it says in 37, now he came near to the path down the Mount of Olives and the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Right, right before this, we see in John that Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. He has brought somebody dead back to life. Now, I don't know about you, but if the guy that raises somebody from the dead is coming into town, it's probably worth going to look at, right? Probably worth going to see. And all these other things have happened, right? So there's this buzz. Jesus, hits the, he's hitting the path. And there's this excitement that sits around. And the disciples and some people in this crowd begin to say this. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest, right? This is not some accident. They're not just proclaiming and shouting something, but they're looking back and proclaiming this promise that is put in Psalms 118. And it says, he who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. I don't know if you guys caught that, but there's a little bit of difference here in what the crowd begins to say, right? It's not just he who's blessed in the Lord, but they begin to take this a step further and the disciples begin to proclaim that Jesus is king, that he is the I am. They make this bold statement of saying, look, here's the Messiah, the one that we have waited for, the one that was promised. This is him. This is is who saves us. But the reality is, this isn't the savior that his people wanted. Right? This isn't what they thought was promised. And so we see in the very next verse, some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Right? Imagine this. Jesus, the carpenter, the nobody, right, from the town of least importance is the one riding in on a donkey. He's not riding in in armor with sword drawn, trying to overtake and kill everybody in sight like these people wanted. He's not trying to put the Jewish people back on top in life as they see it. But he's gentle in riding in on a donkey. And people are still proclaiming this is the king. But the Pharisees see it different, right? 
They see that this goes against everything that sits in their world, right? Because Jesus doesn't look a certain way. And because he's not what is pictured. They begin to ask him, teacher, tell your, your students, tell them to stop speaking. Just say it's all done and it'll be over and we can go on with our business. And Jesus, in true Jesus fashion, begins to look and he says, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, then the stones would cry out. Right, Jesus is looking at these Pharisees and he's looking them dead in the eyes and he's saying, even if these people were to stop, even if man's voice stopped, the stones would cry out and the earth would proclaim the greatness of who God is and the greatness of who I am. Right, he's saying the Father's will is gonna be accomplished one way or another. The truth is gonna be proclaimed. Right, whether it's now or whether it's later. God gets the glory he deserves. Right, no matter what any of us have to say about it or what anybody else thinks, he is the king, right? And he deserves every bit of what can be brought to him. And as great as this moment is and as all of these things are taking place, right? I mean, it's a fanfare. It's like a ticker take parade going on, right? Astros just won the World Series last year. And that parade downtown was insane, right? It was crazy. People everywhere and cheers. It's crazy in this moment, right? They're just proclaiming who Jesus is and all of these things. But the reality is that the majority of these people don't see it and they don't get it. Church, I'm here to tell you today that there is a massive difference, a massive difference in knowing about Jesus and seeing the things that Jesus has done in knowing Jesus and placing your faith in Jesus. There is a huge difference. These people had gathered and they had seen the miracles and they had followed Jesus around and they had seen blind people be healed, right? And some of these people arguably had seen Jesus turning, right, fish and bread into, to feed 5,000. They'd seen the lame walk and they'd heard and seen deaf people be able to speak in. Like they've seen all of these miracles. But the reality is it was just what can Jesus do next and what can he do for me? Which brings us to the next part of this. We only see a couple times in the New Testament where Jesus weeps. And this is one of them. In 41, it says, as he approached and saw the city, he wept for it. Right, this joyous moment where Jesus is with his 12 and they're proclaiming the greatness and he's riding in on a donkey and he's getting the fanfare that he rightfully deserves because he's the son of God. And he sees the city in a distance, and as he begins to make his descent into it, he's so broken, and he begins to weep, right? Like, Jesus was made for this moment, right? Jesus is made to fulfill the will of God and to die for sins. And so he knows that. And as he's coming in and as he's making his way down, this brokenness begins to hit him. And he begins to weep. And he goes on to say this. If you knew this day would bring peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes, right? He said, if only you knew what this day was gonna bring you. Right, the savior of the world is passing by. He is riding by. Salvation is before them and they miss every bit of who it is, right? These same people that are cheering and are excited that Jesus are in town and are watching him walk by on a donkey are the same people, some of them are gonna be the same people that are screaming at him as he carries his cross beside them. Church, don't miss the moment, don't miss it, right? Salvation laid before him. All they had to do was what? Believe. 
believe in who that they had heard about and they had learned about, right? These people knew that Jesus was coming, that the Messiah was gonna be here. They knew what was gonna take place. But they missed every bit of it. They missed every bit of who he is and who he was. Church, we can come and sit in this building all we want, right? We can hear about Jesus all we want. We can have KSBJ and Air One set as number one and two on our radio. But the question is, do we truly know Jesus? Not know about him and not just see him for the things that he's done, but truly know him. Right, this moment, and as he's walking in, is going to be the last journey, like we talked about, that he's ever going to make. But it's such a necessary time, right? It's such a necessary thing because before the foundations of the earth were created, right, God had a plan. And that plan was Jesus. Right, he creates us, he makes us, and he wants to have this perfect relationship with us and knowing that we're all gonna mess it up, knowing that we can't handle it, right, he provides and makes a way. Right, and that way is the sinless, spotless lamb who takes away sins. Church, do you know him this morning? Or do you just know about him? Right, today begins this week-long journey that we celebrate, and rightfully so, right? Christmas is an amazing time, right? It is one of my favorite times of the year. But it doesn't compare to the Savior of the world taking the cross for you and I. Taking the cross to fulfill the will of God. Right, not because he wanted to, right? We even see him in the garden, and we'll, we'll touch on this as we go through the rest of this week and as we go into Sunday, right? Let this cup pass from me. But he does it to fulfill the Father's will, and he does it for every single person sitting in this room today. Every one of us, right? Whether you're a student sitting here in the front, right? or you've been coming to church for your entire life, or maybe you stumbled in here for the first time a couple weeks ago because of German Fest, or maybe today you're just running out of hope and running out of options, so you walked into this building. Let me tell you this morning, there is hope, and there is peace, and there is healing, and it only comes from one place. And that is through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and nothing else. But as you go through this week and as we, we look at our lives and we look at what Jesus did, right, let's think about why are we following Jesus, right? Why are we here? Why do we do the things that we do? And I hope ultimately all of us can come to the conclusion because he paid everything for us. And so because Jesus paid everything for us, I give my life and I follow him and give him everything that I have. The band's gonna make their way back up. Um, and as they're making their way back up, I just wanna let you guys know, we have people here that want to talk with you. They just wanna be with you. They wanna answer questions or prayers or anything that you have. Right, I'll be down front we have deacons and staff members, right? We just talked about our new deacons last week and they're sprinkled all throughout this worship center, right? That's what they're here for. But listen, 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 listen. Don't leave this place today with doubts. Don't leave this place today with questions. Don't leave this place today with unfinished work, right? We're talking about Easter and the Easter week and it's such a joyous time and and for us that know Christ, right, it is a celebration. But if you've never experienced that moment, if you've never been a part of it, right, don't miss it. Don't be like the crowd that just sat there and watched as Jesus rode in and later, right, as he's taking his cross by and miss the moment, right? Salvation is for everyone. Be bold this morning. 
take a step 